Good afternoon and welcome to the Finsbury Food Group PLC Interim Results Investor Presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time by the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of the screen. Just simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it received in the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. Before you begin, I'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd now like to hand you over to John Duffy, CEO, Steve, Steve Boyd, CFO. Good afternoon to you both. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> so uh, myself, John, um, and Steve um, will do a little bit of a back-to-back. -back. So I'll do an introduction, an overview of the first half, and also a little bit on markets and such. And then pass over to Steve, who'll take you through the numbers in detail uh, before I'll finish off again. And uh, then just looking at some of the strategy into action within the group and also the uh, the ME and outlook discussion as well. So without further ado, um, I shall assume um, a sort of similar level of knowledge. Apologies for anybody who knows this already. Um, so Finsbury Food Group, um, one of the largest speciality bakery groups in the UK. We're very well diversified by product category, by channel, and also by geography with some overseas business as well. We operate in very large markets. So in the UK, the grocery, um, sort of, you know, bread and morning goods and cake markets are worth over six billion pounds at RSV. We've got a very broad range of customers within the channels that we operate in, um, both ambient and frozen channels for both grocery um, and food service. We've got very diversified manufacturing capabilities across nine sites. And our bakeries tend to be product specialists, so we don't make all products um, in all of the bakeries, for example. And as well as having great relationships for our retail customers and their brands, we also have a very strong branding portfolio as well, which we license. And that's with a lot of people like Thornton's, Mars, Disney, and many more. So we're number one in a number of the specialty bakery categories. So things like celebration cakes, particularly kids' birthday uh, cakes, uh, branded and organic breads um, and premium round cakes as well. So a very well diversified business. So moving to uh, an overview really of the first half. First half for us was a record sales performance. And so we had sales um, year on year, which grew by just under 9% to 166.5 million. And I say that record first half sales performance. And it was driven in mainly volume um, across um, all elements of our business. So within the UK food service channel, which I'll show you the size of that later, um, obviously with lockdown reversing, we saw very strong growth up 26% in the first half. Our UK retail business across cake and bread grew at 1.5% year on year in the first half. And our overseas division uh, grew by 32%. And within that, um, growth in the overseas division, the vast majority of that is actually through a business called Lightbody Europe, which um, up until Monday, uh, we actually owned 50% of, even though it's consolidated in entirety into the group's numbers. So we increased our stake on Monday um, from 50% to 85%, and that's on, on its way to, within two years, um, owning 100% of that business. And that's pretty much in line with our long-term succession plans for the founders of that business. And it demonstrates that we've got a real good appetite for more European growth. And we've seen a lot of success in the acquisitions and the work that we've done in Europe over recent years. Now moving to the bottom left on this slide, looking at our performance and the top line in terms of EBITDA, at just under 12 million pounds worth of EBITDA, down about a million pounds year on year. And similar figure, profit before tax, 5.7 million. And really, the story of the first half was rather large and unexpected, i.e. unforecasted inflationary pressures in a number of areas, such as energy and labour would be good examples. And a little bit of a lag um, by us realising um, the costs were higher than we had forecast, and then implementing price recovery. And that price recovery was complete by the end of, before the end of the first half, and we'll enjoy the benefits of that in the second half. Basic EPS, 3.2 pence per share. Um, we expect to deliver full year performance in line with original market expectations for the year. Now, we're delighted to be able to reinstate the dividend after the COVID break. Um, so last year's dividend 2.4p, 
uh, through to the end of 26 of June 21 year. And we have just announced um, this week that we have our interim dividend for the, the current year of 0.83 pence per share, which will be paid towards the end of April. Now, as well as those kind of financial um, focuses and growth focuses, um, we've been very much focused on operational excellence. And as some of you will know, we've got an operating brilliance programme now that's been running uh, for several years. Unfortunately, we were able to continue with that programme um, throughout uh, the difficult times over the last couple of years, with restrictions, etc. And we have done a lot of training and a lot of development of our staff and people virtually and um, using the internet. The Operating Brilliance Programme has helped us in the first half, so the operational improvements that we've made have certainly helped offset some of the cost inflation that we've seen, and also helped us in terms of some of the supply chain um, challenges that we've had as well with labour and packaging availability, etc. And continuous improvement continues. Moving on to sustainability, we've got a great agenda now within the business. Uh, we've got you know, science-based targets, which we'll share with you later in the year. Um, and we're driving continuous improvement now, and it's probably most obvious in areas like energy and waste management, which for a food manufacturing business are kind of key areas to demonstrate and deliver some improvements. We're also very, very focused on our people, and we continue to invest in the development, engagement, and the health and well-being of employees. And I'll touch on that a little bit later as well. Now, just looking at the kind of you know, growth side of the business, our cake business has actually um, you know, got a very strong branded portfolio, licensed branded portfolio, as I mentioned earlier. And that grew by just under 12% year on year, um, which is ahead of the wider cake market, branded cake market. And licensed brands now make up some 27% of our cake sales in the UK. So very significant part of our business, differentiated and um, with real USP. Example of that would be our Xbox cake, which was the largest selling branded celebration cake in the market last year um, and shows the importance of areas like gaming, and particularly now that it's very much mainstream across all age groups. Um, also, our um, sort of gluten-free uh, businesses are doing really well on the back of some recipe improvements and continuous enhancements, um, as are, you know, kind of both in the UK and Europe, showing strong organic growth, and we'll touch on that a little bit later as well. Now, given the challenges that we've got, it's good to be able to remind everybody um, that there's been a lot of challenges in recent years and Finsbury has a very good track record of navigating those difficult market conditions. We've got a much stronger, a much more integrated and a much more well-invested business. And driving group scale and best practice is now part of how we do business and definitely helping us through these difficult times. Now, turning to the markets in which we operate in, just to give a little bit of perspective within those, you could be forgiven if you've been reading the headlines or watching the news um, in our first half um, to think that Christmas might not happen. And there was an awful lot of uh, stories on, on the newspapers, you know, talking about labour and drivers and energy, and, and we wondered whether we would be able to uh, have the big meal and big celebrations around Christmas. Well, I can, you know, happily say that the industry and indeed you know, both our customers and manufacturers did a brilliant job of making sure that they did provide everything we would expect for Christmas. And, and that's borne out in the following few slides. So firstly, a little bit of a complex slide here, um, but actually it's quite a simple message that I wanted to just give you a feel for. So this is the UK grocery market, looking at sales um, by week um, over the course of the year. And then you can see the very light coloured blue line is 2019, which is pre-COVID, so that's sales value per week. And then you can see that over the last couple of years, the supermarket industry and the, the grocery industry has done very well during periods of restrictions and indeed has seen strong growth consistently in those 2020 um, sort of you know, blue line and the darker 2021 line. Gives you a really cute, a clear view of how well they've done in terms of growth versus the pre-COVID period. Um, a little bit less in, um, in, in the sort of second half of 2021, our first half, basically because there was um, year on year less periods of social restriction. Um, but sales are still strongly ahead of the sort of pre-pandemic levels that we saw back in 2019. So very encouraging for the grocery channel overall. And for us, because we've got a very large grocery business in both our bread 
and archaic divisions. And then looking at the other side of um, our business, which uh, channel wise, which is the out of home uh, area. And what you can see here is that for a large number of years, so you know, that goes from late 2016 through to the sort of where that dip is, uh, sort of early um, 2020, just pre-COVID, um, eating occasions out of home uh, measure around 2.3 billion, believe it or not, um, over the course of the four week period and uh, pretty stable, pretty consistent around that level. Um, obviously the lockdowns from COVID um, brought that down initially to about a quarter of its normal level, just under. And then what you can see over the last couple of years is a sort of, you know, a fairly volatile, um, but improving picture back in terms of people being able to um, eat out of home. Back almost, but not quite at, um, at pre-pandemic levels by the end of 2021. Um, um, a little bit of upside still to come there. Now, obviously there's a little kind of um, picture at the end of, of, the, of the, where the data isn't yet available. And in essence, Omicron and some of the restrictions and some of the changes in behaviour uh, where people were not going out as much or not doing their Christmas parties uh, late December in order to make sure they didn't get COVID during the Christmas holiday period uh, meant that there was a little bit of a, a short-term noise. Um, but I'm sure that will bounce back. And indeed, we have seen that um, over the last month or so that people are getting back to normal again. So it gives you a bit of a feel how things are moving within uh, our two major channels in the UK and the impact of COVID and such over the last couple of years. If I then turn to some of the changing consumer trends, um, you know, and give you a bit of a sense of what we're seeing now. Well, starting on the left hand side, snacking at home is still very much higher than it was uh, pre-pandemic. So there are 38 million more snacking moments every week than there were pre-COVID, believe it or not. Um, and a lot of that, of course, is because some people are able to work from home either all week or indeed some of the week versus pre-COVID. pre, you know, pre -COVID. And that's a good opportunity for us, whether that's cake stacking, um, whether it's um, some of our sourdough breads for lunch, uh, or whether it's you know, just using rolls rather than sandwiches, sandwich bread because people are a little bit bored um, and want a bit of variety, all good for our product portfolio and our share of the grocery market. Secondly, health is very much more front of mind. Um, so consumption for health reasons, uh, much higher than pre-COVID. Now those health reasons are many and varied because people tend to look at health and food in very different lenses. But think vegan, think free from, think high protein, think organic, all reasons that people choose a product um, over a standard product um, as a result of their, their view of health benefits. Thirdly, takeaways, so delivered takeaways to home was huge during lockdown, one of the real growth areas. What we see now is that there's still growth in a number of occasions, uh, but there's a little bit of a reduction in the average spend value. Probably unsurprising, so as people can actually get back out to, to restaurants and such, um, they're probably prepared to spend a little bit more doing that than having good high quality food delivered takeaway to home. But the value sector is growing, so for us, a um, big customer of ours is KFC, and they would be a very good beneficiary as an example within the value um, sector of delivered home. And then finally, thinking a little bit more um, about the future, um, very much top of mind at the moment in the media, cost of living concerns are certainly increasing. So whether that's inflation now, so CPI running at about five and a half percentage points, um, rising energy prices, national insurance hikes due soon, um, all things that would make consumers a little bit more cautious about their ability to, uh, to spend. And for us as a business, um, you know, we have been through uh, recessions before. It's some time now, but I was also um, a CEO of Finsbury back through the last one. And it's fair to say that food is defensive versus many other sectors. It's also fair to say that we um, have recognized that people will still treat themselves, um, but it will be affordable treats perhaps. Um, and our portfolio has proven to be very resilient in previous recessions um, because people have perhaps celebrated at home or, or bought um, you know, some, some nice products to share with, with family and friends at home rather than, than going out in times of financial stress. So we feel reasonably comfortable despite the, um, the challenging conditions for consumers. And then just having a quick look at our overall market performance by some of the key areas. 
And so on the left hand side for both bread and cake, we've got a retail sort of grocery performance. Uh, and this is over the last 12 months in value. And, and that's just the market where we've got that data, which is really just the grocery channel. And then the next two um, sort of columns along are essentially our food service and bread and our food service cake business. And then finally, on the right hand side, our overseas division. And the story really for us over the last 12 months or so has been the rebound that we've seen within the food service channel, which has been quite strong. Obviously, I just showed you the outform eating occasions a few minutes ago with strong growth coming back. And what we've been trying to do is to grow in uh, the grocery channel, which has also been a beneficiary of COVID, whilst responding and switching capacity within the business back to support that food service growth as well. And, and that's been quite challenging. We could have sold more in the, in, in the, last, certainly in the first half, um, but we had some labour availability issues um, for good and bad reasons, probably, um, and some other operational supply chain challenges for products that we buy, such as packaging, etc., cetera, um, and all the crop impacts around that. So if we had been able to make more, we would have been able to sell more. But overall, growing in line with the market over the last 12 months um, within the grocery channel, but more importantly, driving really strong growth on the bounce back in food service. In the first half, those growth numbers, sort of, you know, first half on the same period a year earlier, would have been even higher. So for bread and morning goods, it would have been 24% growth. And in food service cake, it would have been 45% growth. So that gives you a feel for the sort of lockdown period versus a much more normal period in the first half this year. And then our overseas business growing at 30% over that 12 month period and continuing in the first half, it grew um, 32% versus the first half in the prior year. So pretty consistent, steady growth now for quite some time. So a good um, solid performance um, across the board and a bit of momentum to continue with that, uh, particularly hopefully with some of the operational and labour and supply chain issues starting to ease now after Christmas. And then just looking at some of the product areas, it's always um, an area that we spend a lot of time on. Um, we, you know, it's great to work for a business that's got a lot of really good products that everyone can relate to. Um, so innovation, uh, absolutely key, particularly now that um, you know we're sort of, you know come back post COVID, people are looking for newness, looking for interest, uh, and really I guess the themes that come through here probably would be vegan, artisan, general wellness, including free from. And also our very strong uh, licensed brand portfolio, some of which you get to see here as well. So things like the Xbox cake that I mentioned earlier, the top selling celebration cake, nice celebration cake, uh, nut free. So that's something that's unique to us. Our whole supply chain is organized to be nut free. So we don't put on the back of pack, may contain traces or anything like that. It's guaranteed nut free. Our artisan breads, both traditional artisan breads, sourdoughs, etc., and also free from versions of those as well, both in really strong growth and both filling capacity that we've added in recent years. On the bottom left, um, an example within our cake business of a new vegan brand, a young brand, uh, very much a social media driven brand, um, which we have worked with since the offset. Um, and we now do vegan cakes within celebration, uh, within whole cake for sharing at home and also with food to go cake slices. So good variety of options for people. Also in the middle, vegan donuts, believe it or not. And then a variety of licensed brand products um, from Peppa Pig to the Mars portfolio. So our Mars license sales now are our sort of second largest licensed brand portfolio, with double digit millions of manufacturing sales, higher than that at retail. So a really chunky piece of business. Um, and then finally, a couple of other products, including um, a, a brioche burger bun, which is you know, adding value to this additional kind of you know, you know, bun that people want to you know, respond to. So lots of innovation, lots of opportunity for growth within the niches that Finsbury tends to specialise within. Now, a question that uh, particularly new investors ask a lot is, um, you know, how well spread are we in, in terms of our customers, etc., cetera, um, and our business. So this is just to give you a good feel for how diversified the group is um, and it's updated with obviously the latest numbers and um, post-COVID. So starting on the left hand side here you can see that with the strong growth that we've enjoyed over the last couple of years our overseas, overseas sales are now 15% of the group up from 12% of the group 
um, back at this time last year. And you can see the spread of cake making up just under half the total group and bread um, making up um, just over a third. Moving to the middle um, sort of pie there, this is the UK bakery business, so excluding the overseas piece for a moment just to give us a good feel for the UK. And what you can see is that food service is now some 21% again of UK bakery sales um, with growth in, in, all, in all elements. Um, and that's up from 17% um, for the first half um, in the previous financial year. So it shows the strong bounce back coming through. And again, you can see the split between bread and morning goods and cake with the majority of all our food service business actually being bread and morning goods. And then finally on the right hand side, um, our customers within UK Bakery. So you can start to see um, that we do business with pretty much everyone. Um, yes, we over trade with some people such as the co-op. Um, we under trade with one or two people as well. That's a reflection of how the business has grown, the acquisitions that we've done. And there is scope to grow with some of those customers clearly in, in terms of their market share versus their share of business with us. But overall, a very well diversified business. So I'm going to pass you over now to Steve, um, who's going to take you through the financial results in detail, and I'll pick it up again afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, John. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, that, that previous slide that John went through is very important in the context of understanding the, the financial performance of the group. The, 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 this, this, this slide here gives you the key dynamics. And my objective in working through this slide basically is to give you a good understanding of the relationship between the revenue growth and the profit, but also to give an understanding of what it means in the context of the second half of the year and for the full year. Now, the, fir the first half, as, as we've already said, reflects a very strong revenue growth. And as you saw on that previous slide, we have uh, retail and food service. We have cake and bread matrix that kind of overlap each other. Um, but in all in all four of those, we, ha we, are see we have seen revenue growth over the course of the, the, the first six months of the year. But at the same time as we've experienced and seen that re revenue growth, We've also experienced the onset of substantial inflationary pressures and, and in many respects, un, unexpected but uh, and quite quick on, in its onset. And the, the nature and size of those ultimately dictates and has dictated that the, the most effective way to recover those is through price increases. And the point that John has made, and I will make again as we go on to the subsequent slides, those price increases have already been achieved. They landed at the back half, back half of the current uh, of the first six months, and will have a good bearing on the on the next six months of the business. I will then go through on the next slide. I have more detail of the two sectors that we 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 report on. That is UK bakery and overseas, but this slide continues just at the top level of of the combined uh, impact of them both. So revenue, as, a, as we said, it's grown by 14.6 million pounds or 8.9% uh, and across all, all sectors. At gross margins levels, these gross margins are down 1.5% to 31.6%, driven by the onset of inflation and the delayed recovery of it, uh, again, across both, both the UK bakery as well as the overseas sector. The operating profit and operating margin the, pre the, the, the inflationary pressures referred to above carry forward into, into the operating profit and the related margins. So you can see that the operating profit at 6.5 million pounds is 1.2 million pounds lower than the previous half year. And at operating margin level, the 3.9% is 1.1% lower than last year's 5%. As you would expect, EBITDA cash Cash generated earnings effectively and the PBT are, are equivalently down, both down by 1.2 million pounds. And that would naturally have an impact on the diluted earnings per share. A diluted earnings per share is calculated excluding significant non recurring items and before the amortizer of, int of intangibles. It's calculated on the same base number of shares as the previous period because there has been no change to them. And therefore, the reduction has been from 4.2p to 3.4p. All of these get better context on the next slide. Bank debt. Over a 12 month period, the group has reduced its bank debt by 8.6 million to 12.9 million pounds. And we always say that food is very cash generative, and, and this shows that. 
based on that uh, the the debt of 12.9 million at, at, at the end of the half year on a rolling 12 month basis ebitda is a multiple as as the, the relationship between debt and ebitda is 0.5 times which is very low meaning that there is a healthy balance sheet in support of this business moving on to the next slide as i referred to earlier the two sectors that we have are the uk bakery sector which is the sector on the on the left and the overseas sector on the right and i'll start with the uk bakery sector it represents 85% of the group um, not long ago, it was 90%. So the overseas business is growing quite substantially, which is the dynamic reducing the UK bakery sector rather than anything else. At revenue level, UK bakery revenue growth in absolute terms is up £7.7 .7 million or 5.7%. A small proportion of that, uh, a couple of million pounds, is actually price increases that are referred to that, are referred to that landed in the very back half of the first six months and will carry forward into the into the second half. Um, all, all of the sectors we, we've talked about are, are in growth, food service and retail. But in, in our case, and as per that graph that John showed you earlier on, and as you would expect as we come out of the pandemic environment, food service recovery is the biggest dynamic driving our growth. And this, this in, in six months is up 26% on where it was the, the previous year. Recognize that all the cake products that are sold overseas also are eliminated from this, but our overseas business, which specializes in cake, uh, all those products are made in the UK and they will be made, uh, they have been eliminated from, as you would expect, from, from this, uh, this sector to be reflected in the overseas sector. But just that is a significant part of our, overseas, our UK business as well, the manufacture of products that are sold to our overseas business. Moving on into gross margins. The gross margin is reduced from 34.3% to 33.5%. The overriding dynamic is the inflation that we've uh, referred to earlier on. And a good and simple example of this, which will have affected all of us, is utility prices, where gas and electricity, we, we are a big consumer of, of electricity in particular because of our frozen supply chain in our, in our buns and rolls business and food service. And the impact on both on on just on the profit and loss account, the increase in in the cost thereof is over two million pounds, and that just gives you a good flavour of the dynamic that we've been facing. Um, uh, in many years gone past, we would have mitigated a large proportion of this through uh, our ongoing uh, efficiency in initiatives. John John will refer to a few more of these later, but we have a program called Operating Brilliance which capitalizes on a lot of investment we've made in the past few years on inf uh, IT infrastructure. We have one common platform across the group, which is on the cloud. It makes uh, initiatives such as this cross group uh, very important and deliver substantial benefits. But ultimately, the magnitude of, of the inflation uh, and, the pre and, the, and the cost pressures meant that the price recovery has been the biggest dynamic in the course of the first six months. As I said to you earlier on, it was landed in the back half of the year. It covers all the inflation that we, 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 we needed to recover at that point and therefore will stand us good in the second half of the year and will be the reason why the board is happy to support and we are happy to continue to target the city expectation profit for the full year. One final point for, for those of you who are new to our story is our business is very much a front uh, to uh, the, the the second half of the fiscal in other words the calendar the first half of the calendar is where easter falls we are very big over the easter period a lot of our profit is therefore generated in the second half of the year and this year easter falls into the second week of april so a lot of our profit will actually be generated in 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 the in the last quarter but that is something that we've done for the last 12 years we know it comes a lot of it is hot cross bun business and uh, and it, it is absolutely guaranteed to occur at operating profit and operating margin level the the dynamics of everything i've talked about manifest themselves in both the operating profit figures in absolute terms which have reduced from 6.4 to 4.7 and the operating margin from 4.8 to 3.3 the the fact that we've already landed the the price increases means that the second half figures by definition, will improve substantially from where they from the first half. Moving on to overseas, 
Now, just to remind you, for those of you who are familiar with the story, for those of you who are not, uh, the overseas, it, it, the biggest element of it is our French distributor business, which John referred to earlier on. We now own 85% of it. It is a, it is the, the big on distributing UK manufactured cake products, celebration cake in particular, but also bites, bite products. And it is also where the other business overseas, we have a, a gluten-free factory in Poland, and all, uh, a good proportion of those products made in Poland are distributed through our French distributor in France. Um, as you can see from the revenue line, overseas revenue of 24.2 million pounds, that is 32% up on the, on the previous six months or 5.9 million pounds. Uh, both businesses, both the Polish business and the UK business are in substantial growth. And if you did it on a like for like currency basis, the 32.3% actually increases to close to 40%. So uh, significant growth being experienced in our UK operation, uh, I mean, our European operations. But as I said earlier on, primarily driven by celebration cake business made in our Hamilton factory. At gross margin level, uh, there are two very different businesses in Europe. One is a manufacturing environment environment and therefore usually you would expect a, a manufacturing environment to have much higher gross margins than the other which is like body europe in france which is just a distributor business so it doesn't have high gross margins but has uh, it, it has a, a proportionately higher operating profit percentage and that simple dynamic the mix of the two means that as like body europe has grown much more substantially than the, the polish business it has reduced the gross margin percentage but even then, for the European operation, there is no getting away from the similar inflationary pressures that we have experienced in the UK. And, and that, that applies both to France and, as well as Poland. If you, if you looked at it on a constant currency basis, then the, the gross margins in, in Europe would be uh, about £350,000 higher. But of course, that wouldn't affect the percentage gross margins. They would stay the same. At operating profit level, that has grown by 0.5 million pounds to 1.8 million. So that's a 41% growth. And finally, operating margins have grown through the leveraging of the revenue growth. So as the overheads on the on overheads, as, as the revenue grows, the overheads are relatively static and that is driving forward the percentage operating profit. Um, on to cash flow, which as I said to you at the beginning, the businesses, uh, food is generally quite cash generative. Our free cash flow in the first six months is 4.8 million pounds, which compares to 6.8 million pounds in the previous year. The reduction is primarily driven by the reduction in EBITDA, so the very top line, but also an absorption of working capital. And as the businesses come out of the pandemic environment, and as they regrow again, as you saw uh, on earlier slides, then it tends to absorb capital. In this case, when, when, when I analyzed it, it in fact uh, uh, represents, uh, 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 this is increased by 2.6 million, but actually over 3 million, of it, 3 million of it represents growths in stocks ready to service Easter. And Easter for us, as I said earlier on, is substantial. So we're building Easter stocks earlier. I said to you earlier on as well, with regards to energy, we freeze these because the demand is so big in that period, you can't instantaneously turn on manufacturing capability. So you build the stocks over a number of periods and that is driving the increase in working capital. Uh, the capex at 1.9 million pounds is lower than the previous half of the year, but that is a matter of timing. Uh, we continue to invest in capex and indeed in line with the expected growth in food service, we are investing in additional buns and rolls capacity in our Sheffield site. And the expenditure related to that will be in the second half of the year with the revenue and the growth associated with that coming in the, in the, in the following fiscal year. Lease payments reduce, and this is just legacy issues as old sites are now closed. And by, the, by next year, these will vir be virtually uh, gone. So we'll reduce considerably. Uh, all, all have now been, uh, these leases have all terminated. So it's just a matter of time before it, it doesn't affect us anymore. On interest, it's lower because of the lower levels of debt. And on tax, it's just a, a distortion of the quarterly cash flow. Last year, there were three quarterly cash flows in the first half of the year. 
and there are about 500,000 go this year. There is only two, and therefore that drives the, the, the reduction in the cash flow on taxation. Finally, on, on dividend, just to reinforce what John said right at the beginning, we, we paid a full and final dividend in the first half of the year that related to the previous fiscal year, and that was at 2.4 pence per share. This was as we came back onto the dividend list following a, a temporary absence in the early days of COVID as we, we got to understand how it was affecting us. We continue to, uh, with the dividend policy, so we've we have declared an interim dividend of 0.8 pence per share in, in the first, uh, that will be payable in about April, um, reflecting the ongoing intention to be uh, a dividend stock or a dividend paying stock. Finally, just to touch base on the acquisition of Lightbody Europe, we've bought a further 35% of the business, and this is because of the substantial growth that we see available to us in Europe. Uh, driven by our UK model of celebration cake, um, but um, also with regards to gluten-free and with regards to bite-style cakes, all of those are made by our, our, our businesses either here or in the po in Poland. We we bought that business on a multiple of six times its EBITDA, which was about 3.6 million. It's subsequently grown to over 4 million, so already it's looking to be a good deal. And the the the, the current EBITDA, as I said, Will, will manifest itself when you work into a profit for tax, and profit after tax, in our view, into an EPS accretion of around 0.4 to 0.5 pence per share. So uh, it just reinforces our belief in Europe and the fact that we want to invest behind it and having a bigger equity stake is the reason why we're, we're now taking over more control of that business. Um, and then on to John. Oh, no, hang on, there's one more slide for me. And that is the, the, the debt point, just to reiterate a couple of debt points. So the, the debt of the group is we've got £90 million worth of facilities available to us, which in the context of the level of debt that existed on the balance sheet at the time, £12.9 million, as you can see, is more than enough. It gives us a lot of five power, five power and headroom for um, acquisitions should we want to do it. Uh, point to note is that those are coming toward, they, they expire in 2023, so we will be renegotiating those debt facilities during the course of the year. But as if, if we replicate what we have, and then you can see that we've got significant capability. But at the same time, the other key point to make is that as a multiple of, of debt to EBITDA at 0.5 times, we've got a very healthy balance sheet. Um, able to take strain, but also able to facilitate substantial acquisition should we want to do that. We do have a pension scheme on the right-hand side, which is um, a legacy scheme in one of our factories. It closed in 2010 to all new entrants and to the accumulation of any new benefits. It has a deficit of 14.5 million. We've watched that grow over the course of the years as, it, as interest rates or the discount rates continue to be lower and lower. Ultimately, the dynamics underpinning it are much the same. We pay about £500,000 per annum into that deficit and the next actuarial valuation will be uh, as at the 31st of December 2021 when we will be updating it for uh, membership uh, history and experience as well as changes in the mortality table. But I don't expect it, uh, knowing what I do know, to deteriorate any further from what we have now. If anything, I'm expecting it to improve. So that's that's it from me, John. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, lots of numbers to digest, and I, I'm sure we'll come back on some of those on the questions. So moving then uh, to strategy and outlook. So a couple of slides on that, including some you know, some discussions around M and A as well. So firstly, uh, just to remind everybody, um, and on anybody who's new as well, uh, we're trying to build the leading specialty bakery group. So that's the goal that we set ourselves. Um, some years ago and we've been progressively delivering that very consistent strategy uh, we don't flip flop around um, we've kind of you know summarized it there there's, there's a little bit more detail obviously in our annual report but you know to invest in our factories and our people to innovate um, and drive consumer trends and, and customer focus with that having a balanced portfolio of both yes retail partner brands but also licensed uh, brands as well be very much multi-channel and driving growth both in the UK and internationally. So those are the those are the kind of you know the levers that we set ourselves. And then our operating principles, which is the little wheel there, and which is then listed on the right hand side, 
are, are pretty much the language and the the six things that we focus all of our strategy into action in within the business year in year out. So yes, we we tweak them as as you know things change and market change and products change, but they're very much the consistent way that we approach all of the business. Now a couple of them sustainable approach and also people who care. I'm going to pick those up on the next slide when I just try and look at some of the initiatives that we've got underway under the, the sort of the ESG lens, which is uh, very popular, um, on, particularly among investors at the moment. But some of the other ones, um, so taking operation or operating excellence, a couple of things there. So uh, Project Clint is a big investment that we've got on. Most of the money will be spent in the second half of this year to put in a new Buns and Rolls line. And that's because having seen the growth that we've enjoyed in the grocery market and also the rebound in the food service market, um, there's a good opportunity for some, some good strong additional sales there and we need some capacity to do that. Additionally, um, we've grown our UK free, uh, free farm business this year, uh, probably in the region of 40% as with some new products and some new customers. And we've added some additional capacity to make that possible in the site as well. So a lot of what we've been doing operating wise in the last little while is about adding new capacity to, to sort of deliver on the growth that we're enjoying and maintain the momentum. Moving to quality and innovation, absolutely critical given the types of products that we focus on. We're all about the special, we're all about the differentiated. But also it's about you know the sort of the, the very much day in, day out. So we've got programs around things like process blueprint in all of our factories. And that's about improving conformance of our processes, our people, um, and thereby reducing customer complaints on anything that isn't quite as it should be. And that's a big initiative that we've got on across the group. Similarly, we do a lot of innovation and innovation can be quite time consuming. There's lots of steps to be done. There's lots of information to be gathered. There's lots of costings to be done. And there's a lot of information to be given to customers in terms of specifications and back and pack. And at the moment, that's quite manual in our group. So we're rolling out a system uh, as we speak uh, called Point 74, which allows us to do all of that in an automated fashion in the same manner across the entire group. Um, speeds it up and makes it a lot less administratively um, challenging. Moving on to cost effectiveness, to just to give you a couple of examples there. Um, we moved to a new group supply chain function um, about a year and a half or so ago now. And in doing that, it's allowed us to scale up and get benefits and best practice. And one of the things that we're doing now is we're rolling out a new supply chain software, uh, which allows us already to do all of our demand planning for all of our products and all of our customers in one system, um, in one place if we choose. Um, and we'll also be able in the future to schedule our supply chains better and to also schedule and optimize our transport and, and even the labor for our factories, given the different demands at different parts of the season. Another opportunity we're pursuing there, the Operating Brilliance Programme we've talked about, so continuous improvement, absolutely key, particularly in an inflationary environment where we want to demonstrate both to ourselves and our customers that we're doing everything we can uh, to reduce and remove cost before pushing um, any of prices on to customers and consumers and potentially making their lives harder as well. And then looking at growth with our partners, I think from some of the slides I showed you earlier, you get a really good feel for our innovation. Um, it's differentiated. It's you know, trying to align it to real consumer needs and interests. So whether that's nut free, whether it's vegan, um, you know, whether it's the great brands that we've got, and particularly some of the, the newer brands that we've brought into the portfolio, even you know, like Bosch or some of the Mars um, Galaxy Cakes, etc. Um, you know, great opportunity to bring some newness to the picture and drive growth um, for our customers as well. So that's. Um, I suppose probably quite a few examples I've thrown out of here to give you a feel for what we're doing within the business. And those are the things that we'll continue to do long term, um, regardless of what short term pressures and challenges we face. Um, ESG, uh, you know, very, very much on, on investors' agendas at the moment. Um, we have done an awful lot on our ESG agenda. We tend to look at it through the lens of our operating principles. But just picking it out and putting it in the ESG lens to just help give a bit more perspective. Um, I've got some recent developments or examples of things that we're doing. It's not exhaustive. We've got much longer lists of what we're doing under ESG. But these are some of the things that are taking our priority at the moment. 
So looking at the left hand side there under the environmental piece or the planet, um, as we might describe it internally, we have rolled out energy monitoring to all of our lines and all of our factories now. And that allows us to sort of really focus on, you know, optimizing and reducing the amount of energy we use. We're about to do the same thing now on water usage. Okay, it's not as valuable, but it's just as important in terms of the sustainability initiative. And there are a lot of really good continuous improvement projects that our teams are working on under the Operating Brilliance program now. Um, you know, things like how do we reuse some of the waste heat within our factories to, you know, to do other tasks um, rather than create um, new energy use to do that. We're 100% um, you know, or zero waste to landfill now. And despite some challenges in terms of being able to access our factories and get components, we will have converted all of our bakeries to LED lighting by the end of the current financial year as well. And not on the slide, but we're also looking at solar and CHP initiatives. So we've been working with a specialist third party for some time now. And I suspect before long, we'll be doing our first big program at our largest, most automated factory in order to improve our footprint there as well. So lots happening. On the social side, or as we might call it, you know, the people agenda, um, we've got some really, really strong initiatives. So we, a couple of years ago, rolled out uh, sort of Facebook for Business, it's called Workplace, uh, and that allows everybody with a mobile phone or a laptop or whatever um, to be engaged with everybody else within the group. And uh, that's been terrific with things like COVID to keep people up to speed and talk to them, but also for collaborative ways of working, it's been great. The other benefit it has, including our shop floor staff, is it allows them to um, you know, give us feedback through automated bots, which do engagement surveys, We're just doing one at the moment, so looking forward to seeing what the results of that are. Um, next big area really is around our health and wellbeing strategy, which we've been rolling out gradually um, over the last couple of years. So three pillars to that, um, mental, physical and financial wellbeing, all equally important, you would argue. Under the mental one, we have now got um, you know, over 50 trained mental um, health first aiders within the business. And we're doing all sorts of campaigns. Um, at Christmas, it was loneliness, uh, which is something that had um, sort of big resonance with people. We work with a number of specialist third party providers as well within the, um, you know, the whole sort of mental and physical health. So you know, Health Assured, or uh, we use extensively. Um, we also use Fusion Occupational Health for all of our sites. So lots of resource, lots of initiatives. And then the last one that we've been driving, uh, in fact, Steve's been leading with, with quite a few of his team within the finance function, is financial wellbeing. Uh, so areas like pension, areas like um, sort of payday loans, but you know, sort of through a professional firm, allowing people to accelerate early payment of their, of their wages, et cetera, and avoid any distress um, associated with um, you know, sudden demand that they've got for cash. And then finally, um, on a kind of you know, national basis across the UK, we've got really strong community engagement with people like Grocery Aid, which is an industry charity for people um, who have fallen on hard times within our sector, um, and also Fair Shade Share, who are one of the largest redistributors of food from manufacturers and retailers and to banks, to banks and various other uh, good causes across the UK. And then finally, on the right, governance. Um, as a, a very large aim company, over 3,000 employees, um, we fully comply with the QCA corporate governance code. We've got a very good board, very good disciplines. But areas of opportunity that we've been developing, uh, firstly, I guess, would be, you know, so as a group so, uh, risk steering committee now, which Steve and I both sit on. Uh, we've got a dedicated you know, health, safety, environment and risk um, officer um, who's one of the senior team again sits on my team. And just recently we've been going through a revamp of all of our group risk processes and how they best feed into our sort of business strategy sessions as well. So we're trying to take a much more holistic view of risk and making sure that we um, think about risk in everything we do in terms of setting our strategies for the business. So lots happening under ESG. Um, perhaps a few more examples um, another time, but hopefully that gives you a really good picture. So moving then to um, M&A, um, so opportunities for sales growth. I noticed there's a couple of questions. We'll come back to those. And, and it really is all about growth. So I, I've talked quite a lot today about the organic growth. So gaining market share in some of our kind of higher growth areas, whether that's refund, breads and morning goods and cakes license celebration case we talked a lot about the UK and overseas and art and artisan breads which is a really strong area of growth for us. Um, diversify across channels allows us to cross sell we'll continue to do that 
Uh, and I guess there's a big element where the more competitive we are, the more automated we are, and the more efficient we are with all the systems investment and extra capacity and automation, then actually the opportunity to take share in the markets that we already operate within is pretty key. But having, you know, hopefully done all of the organic growth initiatives, um, it's worth reminding ourselves that the group has also been built over the last 20 years by probably about a dozen pieces of significant acquisition. And we want us a sort of very clear strategic fit. If we look at, you know, what are the two sort of, you know, alternatives, it's either to accelerate market consolidation in one of our core product areas, so you know, buying Manila Buns and Rolls business, for example, or potentially, you know, buying something that diversifies our business, so either adds new products that we don't do, perhaps a new category that we, adjacent category, um, new customers, new channels, or indeed any of those things with additional geography. Last couple of examples, Ultra Farm operations in Free From, both in the UK and in Poland. Um, previously, Johnson's acquisition a few years back, moving into food service cake. So always looking to do something which adds value to the overall group shape. What I would say in, in acquisitions is that there's been a healthy interest, um, you know, in food and drink businesses for sale over recent years. Private equity has played a large part in that. We're beginning to see now that there are some distressed businesses that have struggled to come through COVID and potentially, you know, balance sheets are not in good condition um, or perhaps are struggling to pass on some of the inflation that they're seeing now. So we also anticipate that there is going to be more businesses available um, in, a, in a sort of you know, more distressed and more challenged um, environment over the next little while. So we are in very good shape. Um, we will keep looking for acquisitions. As I say, we've done many in the past successfully. And Steve pointed out we've got very strong banking facilities as well to allow us to continue to drive acquisition growth as well as organic growth. So just coming to the last slide then um, from, from me, um, a very robust group, um, a well-invested group, and we continue to invest in the group um, to make sure that we are the most competitive and the most innovative. Um, and we're very well positioned now, I think, particularly with the bounce back in food service and such. Um, to benefit from hopefully more normal times ahead. We've got a very strong track record of navigating difficult markets and you know, there been various challenges over the last few years, which I think have, have proven that, tested it, tested us and proven that. Um, and if we look you know, over the first half, we didn't expect the level of inflation that we saw, um, but we've dealt with it, we've addressed it, and we've recovered it. Um, and that's exactly what we will continue to do um, with challenging markets and any further inflation that comes our way. We've got a very strong platform uh, within the group, uh, lots of opportunity for self-help as well. So we continue to focus on cost out initiatives uh, and opportunities to be more efficient. So it's not you know, the only recourse. Um, there's also a lot that we can do and do do within the group. We expect to deliver the full year expectations. Um, so. We've done the hard work in the first half that will be you know, showing through in the second half. And fingers crossed, you know, no more disruptions out there. Um, strong volume expected in the second half, particularly in the final quarter, uh, as Steve says, which should deliver the numbers that we expect. And then just that point on ambition. Um, we have got a platform that's capable of being a much bigger business, a board, a management team, and also the asset base and skills. And We've got the balance sheet capability to be able to go and do something with that. We're very disciplined. If the board were, were here, they would say, yes, bought on acquisitions are more frequent and we'll continue to do those. But similarly, if there was a structural opportunity to do something more transformational, um, we wouldn't shy away from that as well, although we would be very disciplined on value and financial structure, as you might expect. So that is the end um, of our formal presentation. And so I shall pause there for a minute. John, Steve, thank you very much for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated in the top right-hand corner of your screen. However, just while the company take a few moments to review those questions submitted today, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your investor dashboard. As John and Steve can see, we've received a number of questions throughout today's presentation, and thank you to those investors for submitting their questions. Could I ask you to please read out the questions and give responses where it's appropriate for you to do so, and I'll pick up from you at the end. 
Uh, thank you. Um, so there's a couple of question areas here um, which are coming through. First one's kind of a, a two-parter. So first one is, how are you managing inflationary pressures in your supply chain? Are you passing these on? Could you also talk about geographic expansion and your aspirations? Um, so I think in terms of the, the first um, part of that question around managing inflationary pressures in the supply chain, whether we're passing those on, I mean, Steve, you've talked about that as we've gone through. Um, is, is there anything else you would add on, on, on that part around um, you know, inflation and scale and recovery? Yeah, I would. I mean, I think it's important to recognise, and I think John did say that, that the level and scale of inflation that has affected the UK uh, has been bigger than anything I've experienced in my 30 years in food. And it is affecting everybody, all competitor sets at the same level. And actually the retailers themselves can see it coming through in, in the commodities and, and even in their own energy bills. So it's not as if it is a one-off affecting a particular industry. It is of such scale that the it, there is very little that you can do apart from pass it on. And that is something that the retailers are recognized. And when we went to them, we, we gave them three months notice. We started in September on our price recovery process. We were very open and detailed about what we were facing and why we were recovering that. And in fact, the although the retailers always kind of put uh, initial responses to put up resistance, it actually, it wasn't as difficult as one would have expected. And we did manage to pass on all of the inflationary costs that we were experiencing. And yes, they, they did land in November and December, so maybe a little bit late in the context of the first half, but in the context of the, the second half, it stands us very well. And in the context of the growing business, the growing volumes, um, we feel confident that you know that, that supply chain and those, those inflationary pressures we've adequately recovered and therefore are back to a, a, a kind of stable footing for going forward on those. Thanks, and thanks, Steve. That's really, really useful. Second part of that question was around um, to talk about geographic expansion and your aspirations. I guess we're predominantly a UK group, um, but we've had you know good sort of organic success over 20 years or so with our light bit of Europe uh, business. And indeed, you know, we've kind of gone very cautiously in Europe, uh, but grown it very successfully and it's and it's growing very quickly at the moment. Um, a couple of years ago, our first manufacturing plant in Europe was the acquisition of the Free From Business Ultra Farm, which came with a factory or two in Poland. And that was our opportunity to be an operator of a manufacturing unit outside the UK. So again, we've done that quite small, quite cautiously, although we've doubled the capacity that's available in that business with a new factory in Poland. And we've recently put in some sales teams there as well. In fact, we've got our first uh, deliveries to customers locally in Poland as well as sourcing product through to France uh, through like bit of Europe. So, I guess, yes, we've got very, you know, good geographic expansion um, sort of initiatives underway. They're modest. Um, we would look to grow those organically as well as potentially with the right acquisition. Um, but we would be very cautious. We, we, we kind of recognise that we're a UK management team. Um, we've got good people on the ground out there now, but it's modest. So uh, we wouldn't do anything um, that was going to put, put that at, at risk. We do it in a very step-by-step -step basis. Um, and we would probably look um, to acquire, you know, knowledgeable people in the markets um, that in Europe, if we were to acquire further, and certainly at this point, no, no intention to go further afield in Europe. Uh, the other question here, um, which is kind of very much uh, acquisitions in your statement, you talk about bolt on and transformational. Um, could you expand on that? Um, what would be a transformational deal? Uh, well, I guess the the, the bought on piece is easy, um, so that is um, probably similar to the Ultra Farm deal that we did, or the Johnson's deal that we did in recent years, or the Olympia like, Europe deal that we did uh, this week. So they're all, um, you know, sort of very obvious, um, and we've done those typically 100% on debt um, because they're modest and they're very much within our facilities and our ability to do that. I think we've only really done in recent years um, one big transformational deal. And that was back in around 2013, 2014, where we acquired a group of bakeries, um, mainly bread and morning goods bakeries, um, what was called the Fletcher's Group. We acquired it from a PE owner. It had previously been part of Northern Foods. Um, it had a turnover that was well over 100 million uh, pounds of turnover. 
um, ourselves. We were less than 200 at the time, so it was quite big. Um, we used both debt and equity. Um, we didn't actually use that much leverage, so we did um, raise quite a bit of equity versus our then market cap. Um, and we were very successful over the next few years at driving both growth synergies and cost synergies. Um, and obviously that also had quite a big impact on our scale and our market cap. So uh, a tra transformational deal would be, probably be very much one that was bigger in terms of turnover and probably used a combination of debt and equity if it was if it was um, you know good size and, and very profitable with good value um, because you know that allows us to keep the um, the debt at a modest or more and modest level um, and we wouldn't look to over reach the business on the public markets in, in any regard. So hopefully that sort of answers um, those are the pretty much the questions covered off now. So if there are no new ones coming through that I can see. Um, I'll pass you back to um, Alexandra. Thank you for addressing those questions from investors and a reminder that the company will review any further questions submitted today and will publish those responses on the Investor Meet Company platform. Before redirecting investors to provide you with their feedback, which I know is particularly important to the company, John, could I just ask you for a few closing comments? Yes, certainly. Um, I, I guess, uh, you know, this week um, and at the moment, we're all very focused on this sort of cost reset, the inflation that we're seeing, which, as Steve said, is bigger than anything we've seen for a very long time, if at all, um, in our careers. Um, but in truth, what we're really focused on as a business and have been for a number of years and will continue to be is we'll deal with these events such as cost inflation that come along and we'll respond properly to them. But what we're really trying to do is to you know, use our operating principles, use our strategy, use our investment um, to build the best specialty baker group in the UK and beyond. And by doing that and by focusing on the right things with our customers, with our innovation, with our investment, with the way that we operate the systems, um, we believe that is actually the best way to create long term value for shareholders. And so the focus today has probably been a little bit around um, you know, dealing with cost inflation and the implications of that in the first half. But in practice, what we're really trying to do is pull all of those long-term levers uh, to make the best bet and the best business that we can over the longer term. So thank you very much for your interest and for listening. It's very much appreciated. John, Steve, I'd like to thank you once again for updating investors today. Could I please ask investors not to close the session as you'll now be automatically redirected to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and I'm sure be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Finsbury Food Group PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation and good afternoon to you all.